Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, if the few of you who are still standing would like to take their seats, and I invite everyone to turn their phones onto silent, I'd be grateful. Uh, I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President of Communications and Policy Outreach here at the Centre. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you and for us to be working with so many partners on this timely and important uh, event. It's a bit of a celebration today, celebrating past successes of the Presence Malaria Initiative, but also thinking about the news last week of an expansion of the programme to new countries and launching, as many of you will know, a special supplement of the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene containing nine new articles, some of which give us that, that, that link between PMI interventions and a reduction in malaria, evidence of success, which here at CGD we very much like. Uh, we will be live streaming today's event, so welcome to those of you who are watching remotely. We encourage you to live tweet the event. Um, we ask you to use the CGD Talks hashtag that you can see on the screen over there. I'll also be using that hashtag to take questions from the live stream later on during the event. Now, our honorary co-hosts today are Senator Chris Coons and Senator Roger Wicker, who are co-chairs of the Malaria Caucus. They sadly could not be with us in person today, uh, but they were keen to voice their continued support for the cause uh, and this event. Uh, we'll start today's program with a video message from Senator Coons, followed by keynote remarks from CGD's president, Masoud Ahmed, and also from Dr. Kassete Admasu, the CEO of the Rollback Malaria Partnership. So with that, I'm going to invite my colleagues to let us hear the remarks from Senator Coons. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, and as the co-chair of the United States Senate Caucus on Malaria and Neglected Tropical Diseases, I'm thrilled to be with you for this event that highlights the impact of malaria interventions in Africa and around the world. First, I want to recognize the Center for Global Development, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, the President's Malaria Initiative, the United Nations Foundation, Malaria No More, and Friends of the Global Fight for working together to convene this event and for all the incredible work you're doing to further our shared goal of eradicating malaria. This event is an opportunity to step back and look at the progress we've made in fighting a disease that is an enormous and unnecessary burden on millions of families and children around the world. Through the President's Malaria Initiative, each year we get closer to making our goal of a world without malaria a reality. The World Health Organization estimates that more than 6.8 million malaria deaths were averted worldwide between 2001 and 2015, mostly among children under the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa. The greatest progress occurred after 2005, when the President's Malaria Initiative programs were operational and making real contributions alongside partner countries and other donors to malaria control efforts. And here tonight, we're celebrating the launch of a new supplement to the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene that includes nine contributions on malaria control interventions. These articles pave a path for executing a new generation of high-impact evaluations, helping us to continue the fight to eradicate malaria and other critical health conditions in low-resource settings. These are signs of real progress, but we have more work to do. With over 200 million people still suffering from malaria, 90% of whom live on the continent of Africa. And as everyone here tonight knows, malaria prevention and the promotion of children's health around the world happens in a bigger context. We also need to continue to support advances in the provision of clean water, safe shelter, medical care, education, innovation, R&D investments, and healthcare infrastructure. We have to advocate twice as hard if we're going to keep investing in the research that makes these promising developments turn into real solutions for millions of people around the world. And we have to keep telling our stories about the difference that it makes when America engages around the world. I'll be your ally in this fight today and every step of the way. So for tonight's event and for your commitment to this ongoing work to fight malaria worldwide, thank you. Uh, welcome to all of you for joining us for this event. And I want to uh, just say two things to you as we launch what are going to be some fantastic uh, panel discussions. The first is that uh, this is exactly the right moment for us to be having this kind of discussion. 
because uh, we now have not only the progress that we can see, but also the evidence that enables us to identify how we can learn from that experience to be able to deal with the challenge that lies ahead. And CGD as an organization is devoted to trying to come up with practical policy advice based on solid analysis and evidence. And I think this is exactly the kind of event that, that we love. You know, we, we really uh, get into it because we think this is the way to make better policy going forward. So I'm really looking forward to the uh, discussions we're going to have to the presentations and then the conversation in which I hope you will all participate. The second point I want to make to you is uh, I'm really uh, very happy if you look at the list of names of organizations that are up there, the fact that we are co-hosting this event and co-sponsoring it with all of these great organizations that are all joined together in trying to achieve a common goal, bringing each one their own specific perspective, their competencies, their comparative advantages, is demonstrating, uh, demonstrating for me not just what this event is about, but what, in fact, success in this fight is going to be all about. Because we will only make the progress that we need to make if we can all continue to pull together and, and draw on our comparative advantages and form the partnerships that are needed. So I thank the representatives of each of these organizations who are here uh, for the partnership that you bring to this. And I look forward to the conversation that you and, and others will bring to the next uh, two hours. So with that, let's get on with the substantive discussions. Good morning. Before I begin my remarks, I want to take a few moments to honor and celebrate an unparalleled leader, a man known for his dignity, integrity, humility, and humor. He led the global malaria fight at the helm of the US President's Malaria Initiative for a decade. He is remembered not for his time with presidents and ministers, but his interactions with village chiefs, local malaria educators, doctors, nurses, and rural community health workers. It is my honor to celebrate Admiral Tim Zimmer's service to and leadership of the global malaria fight with this award. Some of you in the audience today may not know, may not have known the change agent that team was in leading the RBM partnership reform process. On behalf of the RBM partnership board, the management team, and the entire partnership, which has become stronger than ever because of team's leadership, I am honored to present this award to the team. Would you please come up to the audience? Good thing I came. I, <laughs> first of all, yeah, for those of you who may not know, I just work down the street at NSA in the White House these days, so my schedule is not my own. So I looked at this as just a breath of fresh air, like an oasis of escaping for a few minutes to be among friends who I hold dear as individuals and also as colleagues who have been engaged in really quite a remarkable journey the last 12 to 13 years. Dr. Cassetti, uh, uh, th thanks for uh, for your comments and for this award. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, thank you for hosting this. But I think his word says it all. All of the individuals represented on the screen and all of the technical providers, but most importantly, the communities in the country, uh, folks that are working day in and day out, 
to uh, follow the programs, uh, care for every fever that shows up, and then administrate the proper uh, interventions to get people back on their feet so they can become members of the community. That's what it's all about. So uh, I'm honored. I shouldn't take any more time, but I'd love to just keep interacting with you more and more. But thank you so much, and I'm honored and uh, humbled by this. I am delighted to be here with you today for such an important event. Together, we have enjoyed immense success and progress, reducing malaria diseases by more than 60%, saving almost 7 million lives, and preventing more than 1 billion malaria cases between 2000 and 2015. The U.S. has been a driving force and an indispensable partner over the past 12 years with the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative and over the last 15 years with a significant U.S. contribution to the Global Fund to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. I salute the U.S. and PMI for tireless work and dedication to save lives and improve health. I salute PMI for walking the walk of partnership first and foremost with countries. The United States through PMI has, has deeply invested and supported nation national malaria programs as they lead the fight against malaria, supporting capacity building across the health sector from the procurement and management of malaria drugs to training of community health workers. PMI has been a tremendous partner in the malaria fight from the start of the initiative, investing in a country-owned plans, strengthening partner country health systems, building capacity and expertise, while also improving malaria prevention and treatment services. PMI has helped fill gaps and delivered emergency shipments of life-saving commodities in times of great need. Some PMI partner countries, like Zambia, are now setting their sights on eliminating malaria transmission from all or part of their nations, an idea that was inconceivable 12 years ago when PMI was launched. You have also played a significant role on the global stage, helping transition the rollback malaria partnership into a new governance structure to move it closely into a new era as we strive toward a world free of malaria. I believe that the RBM partnership is well positioned to meet the challenges of our times. We have a roadmap to a world without malaria, where no one has to die from a mosquito bite ever again. With renewed focus, innovation, and new commitments of leadership and funding, we can be the generation to end malaria once and for all. The End Malaria Council, led by Bill Gates and Ray Chambers, will be an essential partner to inspire more leaders to join the fight, spark new funding, and support the development of new tools to find, prevent, and treat malaria. Members of the End Malaria Council work together with the RBM Partnership to End Malaria to help countries achieve their malaria controls and elimination goals. Although we have exceeded our ambitious malaria goals in the last decade, we still have a long way to go. Malaria continues to cause unacceptable levels of days and suffering. In Africa, a child dies every two minutes because of the disease. The last WHO World Malaria Report 2016 points out that although global access to key anti-malarial interventions has continued to improve, critical gaps in coverage and funding are jeopardizing the attainment of global targets. Now is not the time to sleep or let the gains be reversed. The WHO clinic Technical Strategy for Malaria has calculated the costs of achieving the 2030 malaria goals to be around 102 billion US dollars. Although these costs are high, the benefits will even be greater. 
more than 10 million lives will be saved and over US $4 trillion of additional economic output can be generated. These returns will bring greater productivity and growth, reduce household poverty, increase equity and women's empowerment, and make health systems stronger. The global return on making these investments will be 4 to 1 and increase to 60 to 1 for sub-Saharan African countries. By contrast, failure could see the disease resurge with increased malaria diseases and lost opportunities for progress and development. Elimination of malaria is the only feasible solution to our challenge. The alternative, controlling the disease forever without eliminating it, is biologically and politically untenable. Predictable and increased global health financing is a great challenge ahead. We must find new ways of raising adequate resources. Many low and middle income countries are taking up more responsibility for investing in health. For the first time in the history of global health, Africa is mobilizing more domestic resources for health than foreign development investments in the sector. But only a third of the total malaria financing comes from malaria endemic countries. We are working with countries to make investment cases. I had the honor to participate in the announcement of PMI's further expansion into West and Central Africa with USAID Administrator Green. The United States contributes to effective malaria prevention and control for over half a billion people from the Sahel to the Horn and to Southern Africa. Finishing this fight and beating malaria is not just the right thing to do. It is also one of the best investments we can make in the future. Halting each new cases of malaria helps eradicate extreme poverty. That is because when children and adults are infected with malaria, sick farmers are unable to work in their fields and sick kids are unable to attend class. Less malaria means fewer days missed at school and work and more productive communities. I'm honored to be here today with you to learn more about the important evaluations that have contributed to the solid evidence of the significant contributions of malaria control and elimination to saving lives. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Cassetti. Rear Admiral, this is what happens when you get out of the office for a bit. You see, you get nice. an award. Come back. Nice. Come back. Uh, we're going to reset the stage right now to begin our first panel. So while my colleagues come along and do that, let me tell you, let me just remind you about some of the things that Dr. Cassetti touched on in his speech there and some of the realities of the situation that we're facing. Malaria still kills 429,000 people each year. As Dr. Cassetti reminded us, every two minutes, a child dies from malaria, which, to be sobering, means that since we started this event, it's 10 children. Let's just bear that in mind. There have been successes, and that's what we're here to celebrate, but we also need to think about how can we can do more to really get rid of this scourge. We, as we've heard, between 2001 to 2015, some 7 million de malaria deaths were averted. Uh, and it means that for the first time, malaria eradication is really imaginable and a possibility for many countries. Today, I hope we'll go away with ideas of, okay, what needs to happen now? What's the next step? How do we really make it to that level? Since 2006, when PMI began, more than $5 billion has been invested. In 2016 alone, PMI reached more than 480 million people. As we heard last week, as Dr. Cassetti told us, uh, USAID Administrator Mark Green last week announced an expansion of the program. So I'm just setting the scene for you there. Let's invite our panel to the stage now that our, our chairs are all in place. This panel is entitled, panelists, please come and join us. Achieving a malaria-free world. And we're very, very happy to have an eminent panel, a knowledgeable panel. And as they come onto the stage, I'll uh, introduce them to you. Elizabeth Chizema, sitting down just there. She's the director of the National Malaria Elimination Center in Zambia, Dr. Cassette, you already know. Next to Elizabeth Chizema is Irene Cope, the acting US Global Malaria Coordinator 
for the US President's Malaria Initiative. Uh, Peter Salama is the Executive Director of Health Emergencies Program at the World Health Organization. And Rebecca Martin is the Director of the Center for Global Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention panel. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, this is a discussion, but I'm going to just give you each a kind of couple of minutes to kind of uh, lay out your stall, if you like, with a question to each of you. So, uh, Irene Koch, let's start with you. Um, what do you think has been the single most important aspect of the U.S. role in combating malaria over the last you know, 10, 15 years? Well, I'd say the, the single thing, if you can bring it down to one thing, has been the, the, the point I think Dr. Xete and, and Tim made earlier. It, it is about the partnerships and, and the, the list that you see behind here and the partnerships that, that PMI has had from the very beginning with countries like Dr. Chizema and, and others, as well as with our, you know, the, at the very heart, it is working together with, with countries. It's also been a partnership, it's a U.S. government initiative, and so USAID together with CDC, along with support from State Department and the Peace Corps and other, other U.S. government partners has been core to, to the success here. We've also worked incredibly closely with the other partners like the Global Fund, and the, the work at country level has been core to how we do business, is the the partnership, the coordination with Global Fund to make sure that the U.S. government resources are coordinated around and supplement and, and help make the Global Fund grants go further. And then, of course, the international organizations like World Back Malaria and like UNICEF and WHO and others have been core. And, of course, the private sector has been part of that as well. And the, we've been extraordinarily lucky to have the private sector partnerships. Well, I'd also say, and you heard this um, a little bit from the beginning, we've been extraordinarily lucky to have had strong support both from the U.S. administrations, from three successive U.S. administrations and three presidents, starting with President Bush, who launched PMI in 2005. That was continued under President Obama. And as you heard at the U.N., President Trump has also very strongly supportive of PMI as well as global health, as he noted in his speech on last, last week at the U.N., We've also been extraordinarily lucky to have very, very strong bipartisan support in Congress from the very, very beginning. They see the, they see the importance, as we heard earlier, what, how important this work is, but also the results. And the results of PMI have really continued the resources flowing because we do make a difference and we're able to document it as well. Here on our second panel, all that documentation. Okay, thank you. Remember to speak up. Because you at the back. Um, Elizabeth Chizema. Um, We've heard about U.S. leadership. We've heard about partnerships. We've heard about coordination. What does that mean for you on the ground in Zambia? What has it allowed you to do? Well, thank you very much, and uh, happy to join you here. I think for Zambia, a lot really has happened. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've begun to see a lot of uh, progress. If you look at uh, Zambia as a country, previously we were targeting uh, pregnant women and under five children. But with the U.S. Uh, support, we've been able to move from targeting to full coverage of uh, interventions, life-saving interventions like bed nets. As we speak today, we have about 10 million bed nets being distributed in my country to cover every sleeping uh, space. We've been able to stabilize the procurement of products, uh, making access to effective diagnosis and treatment to all the people within my country. And at the same time, I believe we are a leader, really a model, a country that other countries are learning from when you look at the US support. I think Zambia became a PMI country in 2007. And since then, I think we've never looked back. We've been able to come up with guidelines, with strategic plans. We are now in our third strategic plan. The first one was scaling up for impact. And then the next one from 2011 to 2016, we're looking at sustaining those impacts and really ensuring that we had full coverage. And now we can even talk about the possibility of elimination in Zambia by 2021. We do have government commitment and uh, domestic financing increasing simply because we've had strong partnership with the US government where a lot of the financing really started from. And our government has then been uh, mobilized to support the malaria fight. Just following up with you, Elizabeth, 2021 is your target date or your envisioned date. Yes. What does that mean for you, that almost a reality? How do you feel about that? 
I've been asked a number of times, and I'm telling everybody, that means by 2018, we must eliminate malaria. <laughs> <laughs> and I've only got this year. <laughs> uh, but I still feel like it's doable, and really we have no choice. We've had experiences where we had a real reduction, remarkable reduction in our prevalence, in our mortality, and immediately we stopped implementing or providing all the necessary uh, commodities, we again began to see resurgence of malaria. So for us, really, now is not the time to, to stop. We are not even saying ambitious goals, we are saying realistic goals. So for us, elimination is a realistic goal, and we have 2018 to eliminate so that we are certified by 2021. Wow, okay, okay, great. Um, uh, Dr. Cassette, uh, realistic goals, Ambi is saying, 2018 to 2021. And to achieve those realistic goals for Zambia and other countries, uh, you, you've talked about uh, the continued support. Uh, other speakers, Irene has talked about partnerships and coordination. Uh, what about donor coordination um, and diversification of donors? Talk to us about the importance of that. I mean, has it been there so far? What could be better? And the importance of it. Yeah. I think you know, it's really important for all of us in the global health development space to really focus on malaria elimination and finishing the job once and for all. And this would require substantial increase. Uh, even you know, beyond elimination, to meet the 2030 goals, as I outlined in my statement, it requires huge resources to be mobilized and for donors and partners to be very well coordinated so that investments are not duplicative and add value uh, in all regions and, and countries. Uh, but the bulk of the increase has to come from domestic sources. Uh, that is very clear. Um, so there are a number of initiatives that we can build, build on. One such initiative is the innovative counter-financing re requirement that the Global Fund has. So if all malaria endemic countries uh, live up to that counter-financing requirement, we would be able to raise 1.2 billion US dollars. That's a substantial increase uh, for malaria. So one of the things we as RBM will continue to work is to work with countries to make sure that they live up to the, the counter-financing requirements. The second thing we have to do uh, is to make sure that we diversify the funding base. If you study the global malaria financing landscape, you know, 35% of the global malaria financing expenditure comes from the US, and 16% comes from the UK. So out of the two-third investments that are made by donors, nearly 51% of that investment comes from the two countries. So it's really critical to ensure that this financing from the two countries is sustained in the long term. But at the same time, we need also to work with other you know, donors to the Global Fund and other bilateral donors to increase their investment in malaria. So you know, when I look at the US and UK, one unique feature you would see is a bilateral or the multi-party support that you see uh, in, in parliaments. So we have just heard, you know, the uh, Congress leader, you know, on malaria caucus. You have also a similar all-party parliamentary group in the UK. But we don't have such groups in, you know, a traditional donors like Germany or France or the EU. We really need to build that kind of uh, bipartisan support or multi-party support for malaria elimination so that when administra administrations change through election cycles, the support for malaria financing and for malaria elimination is enduring you know, through that process. So this is one important initiative we, we need to do. We can do the same in endemic countries as well. We are really working with countries like Zambia in, you know, setting up in the malaria councils or malaria elimination councils that bring in leaders in business, leaders in, in parliaments and in, in, in government institutions to really uh, talk about what needs to be done uh, 
and what kind of investment that, that has to be made at the country level to push for malaria elimination. We need to expand these kind of leaders that are committed to malaria elimination, and we would be there to support them through that process. Okay, thank you very much. So we've heard about financing, we've heard about partnership, we've heard about coordination. Uh, one thing also is now, you know, we know what works. Rebecca Martin from CDC. Um, we've got these new articles in the journal that are being uh, launched today. Uh, let's think about the important things in malaria eradication from your point of view, from the scientific point of view. What for you is the most important thing that's going to keep this vision of malaria eradication on track? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, Dr. Ann Shuckett, who was supposed to be sitting in this chair, unfortunately was not feeling well, so I send her regrets, so I'm filling in today. But it is great to be with this esteemed panel and just to <coughs> acknowledge the, the great supplement that has come out um, and really to show the implications of how we make further progress against malaria. Since 2001, the malaria endemic countries have made substantial progress in delivering uh, control um, tools to be able to control, detect, prevent, and treat malaria. And as you heard Senator Kuhn say, this has led to over a seven million, nearly seven million lives saved. And that's an incredible marker in this in time and day of what has been done with the efforts. And these peer-reviewed, rigorous evidence-based science articles that have come out really do show the investments that the US government have made are showing the reduction in malaria infections and also in saving lives, especially infants and young children. At CDC, we do focus on the science. And I want to just take a step back and give a bit of history, because before CDC was established in 1946, we were called the Malaria Control War Areas in 1942. And it was to be established around military bases where they had malaria, so they wanted to eliminate and control malaria for the armed forces. And this is our genesis of where we came out of being established in 1946, focusing on controlling and eliminating malaria in the United States. But over the 70 years of our existence since then, really have moved also into working in global efforts. And science has been what has driven our work and what we do every day. It has shown us the way to go. It demonstrates what needs to be done. And it also tells us where to take the next strategies. How do we make sure we refine strategies as the science tells us what to do? Not only is the science important, but then when you have the strategies, how do you scale them up? How do you make sure that we can take science to scale? And this is important. It's not only randomized control trials, but also how do we look at the important interventions that are critical? How do we evaluate them? How do we make sure that we have the right interventions at the right place at the right time and that we can scale appropriately? Thinking about this, we also recognize over the 70 years of work the importance of being flexible and continuing to innovate. And I say this because we see today complex emergencies. You see disasters. Uh, we see geopolitical situations. And we know that in efforts towards elimination eradication, it's not to save the hardest places to last. Um, and we, I say that from our experience with polio eradication to date to really show that we have to, in areas where there's conflict, how are you going to reach the children, be it with a vaccine, be it with treatment for malaria. The importance of being able to reach those children early is important, and that we look at these efforts. Um, we also have seen this with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, uh, where we can see events occur. And in 2014, in the three affected Ebola countries in West Africa, there was an ex estimated excess of 3.5 million malaria infections that were not treated. And from that resulted many deaths as well. But just one marker to say that events can occur and take over. How do we make sure that we continue and sustain efforts that are important? This comes to the point of that we cannot be complacent. With these articles, you'll see great progress, reductions in infections. But it also means that we can't stop. We need to sustain this, because elimination does not mean that it goes away forever. 
if, you, if situation changes, if environment changes, that disease can come back. And so this is very important. And as people see more potentially in a clinic, seeing negative more point of care diagnostic tests, people will forget about it. And we have to make sure that it stays in the mind because it can come back. And this is important. And how does that sustainability come about? One of the efforts, and it's really great to have Peter Salama here with us, um, thinking about the recent initiative for the global health security. And this is really for every country to have the capacity to detect any threat, to respond to any threat, and then prevent, where possible, any threat that could occur. And these opportunities of looking at, potentially in the future, negative malaria tests, what else could it be? Could it be a case of Ebola? And from that, being able to do that investigation and stop outbreaks where they occur. And this will ensure the sustainability of the work that we're doing. So, to say the sustainability is critical is very important, but also there's more to be done. And if we think about this, the importance of having universal and equitable access to malaria control, proven control tools. We've seen in these articles the importance and the impact at a country level on health systems and what could be done to impact on disease by expanding access to proven malaria control tools. And what are those? In thinking through vector control, insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, looking at indoor residual spraying, thinking up point-of-care diagnostic tests to make sure people have access to this, anti-malaria combination treatments, and then looking at different uh, treatment plans in terms of intermittent preventive treatment and seasonal chemoprophylaxis. But I also want to put up there one important one that we'd like to see transform is surveillance and bringing that into a malaria core intervention. Case-based surveillance, which will provide information about where and what is happening with disease, that you can then accurately have information and you can have timely information to be able to target resources, both human and financial, and also be able to look at what is needed in these areas and be able to address the problem. So surveillance will become a more and more important problem, a uh, solution, excuse me, for these efforts and to address this problem. So lastly, I just want to say, as we've heard, there's nearly every year still 400,000 cases, uh, deaths of malaria every year. This is still an ongoing problem. We still need the science to address what are the continual problems, how do we bring that to scale, and how do we bring it into proven interventions to address and uh, to reach a malaria elimination and long-term malaria eradication. Thank you. So actually, Rebecca, I'm just a quick follow-up with you before we speak to Peter Salama. Um, just on that last point, how do we bring these proven treatments to scale? What is your, what is your answer to that? This is, this is where the importance of the, the science of looking at intervention strategies, understanding what are the known strategies, what are the new strategies, doing the evaluations and the in-country, because it does happen at a country level, and the importance of engaging the community in understanding the implementation of the strategies is important. But it really is about evaluation of known proven tools, being able to implement with a country, with the government, but also the importance of having the community engaged in implementing these proven tools. Okay, thank you. Peter Salama from the World Health Organization. Can you pick up on uh, that last point, the issue of country level uh, coordination, intervention, coordinating in a, in a broader system strength. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. We've heard that statistic about 400,000 uh, deaths due to malaria every year, above 400,000, in fact, several times already this morning. I think it's really important to go beyond the headlines. We know that most of those deaths are in sub-Saharan Africa. We mo know that most of them are in children under five. But it's also increasingly important to recognize specifically where they occur, which countries and which part of which countries are they occurring in. And what we'll increasingly find in malaria is true for all of the sustainable development goals. There's a group of 20 or 30 fragile, vulnerable countries with fragile health systems that increasingly are accounting for the majority of unmet need. Whether we take under five mortality, whether we take maternal mortality, whether we take malaria, whether we take under immunized children. It's going to increasingly be that same set of countries. Rebecca said something really important. Let's not leave the hardest till last. And I think that's the challenge to us now in the malaria community. If I take two current examples from, that, that have kept me busy in the last few months. 
One is South Sudan. South Sudan has had more than 1.3 million cases of malaria this year. It's the number one cause of death. It's the number one reason why people are attending health facilities in the whole country. As a malaria community, we need to ask ourselves the tough question. How much focus have we had on countries such as that? Let me give you another example. Borno State in northern Nigeria. There's been cholera, there's been hepatitis E outbreaks, there's been measles outbreaks. But what's the number one cause of, of death in Borno State affected by Boko Haram violence and insecurity? It's malaria, number one by far. And again, the challenge for us now is how do we relate to those countries? How do we support them? Because these are the countries, we can all guarantee it, that will remain when the Zambias and the other countries, the Ethiopias, have achieved their progress through great country leadership, through supporting health systems. This is what we'll be left with, and these are the most vulnerable people of anywhere in the world. Rebecca also really made an important point around the relationship between essential public health functions, such as surveillance, such as diagnostics, such as detection, such as the health workforce, such as supply and logistics, with broader health system strengthening. And fundamentally, the malaria community has another great opportunity, and it's to leapfrog all of the lessons of previous elimination and eradication initiatives and say, from now, we're going to evaluate ourselves, yes, on universal access to a range of malaria-specific prevention, control, and treatment services, but we're also going to evaluate ourselves on what we're leaving behind in terms of strengthening primary health care for malaria sustainability, but for a much broader range of public health uh, reasons. So let me stop there and uh, say congratulations to you all for being uh, such a great part of enormous success but the challenge is before us, I think, to, to really get to the places that are hardest hit. Okay, thank you, Peter Just a quick point, Dr. Cassette and Elizabeth Chizema. Uh, on this point of these 20 to 30 countries that uh, Peter Salama was talking about, how do you do both? Get Zam countries like Zambia across that line, that, you know, that last couple of miles, one year, uh, and target those 20 to 30 kind of key critical countries? How do you do both? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, Peter's uh, point is really uh, important and critical. So we have to have a tailored country-focused approach with one thing in mind, strong country leadership and building that strong, you know, systems, what we call the enabling environments for malaria elimination and for greater reduction of malaria cases, um, a reality. So... At RBM, we are starting a new initiative which looks at few countries, uh, such as you know, few states in northern Nigeria, uh, Mozambique, um, and few other countries where we have uh, to work with the national governments in terms of understanding the, the malaria financing landscape, and also work with the governments to prepare national investment cases that would help you know improve uh, financial flows also align the priorities of the countries with uh, the financing that would come into the countries most often uh, during malaria discussions you hear uh, lots of you know commodity focused discussions wi without giving so much emphasis on those enabling environments that need to be built so when you look at the investment cases in Mozambique, you would anticipate that in northern Mozambique, access to basic health services, be it through community health workers, a very strong surveillance system, a very good data management system, is going to be a necessity for Mozambique to make good progress. The same can be said in northern Nigeria. So we have to work with critical political leaders to ensure that that commitment and leadership emanates from the countries. It's not something that should be transplanted to a particular setting, but it has to be nationally driven. And our advocacy, our engagement, and our work should be with that mindset of fostering country-level leadership and working with the countries 
to have you know access to financial resources, be it through innovative financing, be it through you know different loans, or be it through you know um, bilateral support or support from multilateral institutions. Yeah, so within countries, basically, it's to understand your burden. And for Zambia, in our new strategic plan, we've been able to classify the different levels of uh, transmission. And we are then targeting interventions according to the epidemiologic strata for each level. And uh, as we then, pr and some of our guiding principle really is to lower the transmission in the highest burden so that you bring down the burden to elimination levels where you can then begin to add in accelerators that will support the elimination agenda. And the accelerators include uh, the introduction of innovative ways, for instance, mass drug administration. We currently have the same tools, so we have to be smarter using the kind of tools that we have. In addition to within country interventions, then we look at cross-border initiatives, really ensuring that you are working with neighboring countries. And some of this is already happening in the SADC region where we have the E8 countries that are targeting elimination in the first eight countries of the southern region. So basically, each country, as he has said, we should target according to the country need. But even within country, there are differences, and you should be targeting your interventions accordingly. I can just build on that, because I, I don't think it's a, you know, the point Peter is making is an extraordinarily important one, but it's not an either or, nor can it be. Uh, because the minute we stop paying attention and the minute Dr. Josema lets up on Zambia, malaria will come back in a really, really big way. We've seen that over and over again. Every time we stop paying attention, it comes back. So it is finding the balance between not only not ignoring the, the, the kinds of places that Peter is talking about, but also helping countries like Zambia get to that, get to the end state and stay there, right? Because as soon as we stop paying attention, it will come back. I mean, it's also one of the reasons why PMI has started, you know, just did launch these five new countries in West Africa, which had been a, a region that had been mm -hmm. left behind. And it's their countries in Sierra Leone, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Cameroon, Niger, and going nationwide in Burkina Faso. All countries where malaria, the malaria burden is very high. They're all could be called fragile areas. The region is quite fragile. So the importance of bringing the, the PMI type interventions, the kinds of things that, that Rebecca was talking about, is extraordinarily important to that region. And it allows us to reach an additional 90 million people who are at risk of malaria. And then how do you uh, include malaria action in broader health system strengthening, the point that both Peter and Rebecca was making, yeah. because you know, that's so crucial as well. So how's PMI doing it? How do you guys advocate doing it? Mm -hmm. What's the solution for doing that, especially in our kind of, uh, the economic and political realities we face? Yeah, it is really important that PMI and the malaria interventions are not separate and off on a different chain from everything else you're doing in health, and that it is built into the health system interventions. The health worker has to be able to diagnose a, a child with fever and identify whether it's malaria and provide the right treatment, or figure out what else that might might be causing that fever. So it's a part of the system, and it's the health worker isn't just the malaria workers, but it really is part of the health system, if you will, as well as supply chain. We do it through PMI. We buy a lot of commodities and, and work with country supply chain to deliver them. But we try to build the capacity of the entire supply chain, not just the, mm -hmm. the malaria supply chain, if you will. It's really got to be all part of the system. And the surveillance processes that, that Rebecca's talking about has got to be for the whole piece. So we really got to make sure malaria interventions are integrated into the overall supply health system and not separate. I was just going to add a couple examples. For example, um, a system that had been set up in Haiti uh, for malaria to be able to report cases and to be able to help with the system was actually able to be used during um, a recent earthquake there and during uh, it was the whole phone system was be able to use to report cases, which was a really good thing to be able to build off what had been built by the malaria program. And in northern Nigeria, if we talk about Borno as well and Kano State, in these areas there are efforts with PMI to be able to look at what's been done in stopping transmission of polio, in working with healthcare workers and community at the facility level how to make sure on-the-job training is done, how to make sure that not only are they just looking for polio, but how are they also making sure that they're also looking at malaria and making sure the case management is done right, that cases are reported, testing is done. So there's real opportunities to build off these, and there are examples of this around the world. 
Peter Salama. Well, really, I, th I think it all comes back to the health worker. I mean, when we're talking about rural parts of poor developing mm -hmm. countries, it's the same health worker. And so ultimately, we have to make sure that that health worker has the tools, the training, and the capacity to interrelate to the broader health system and to do so in a way that's not disease specific. So as much as we want to eliminate malaria, and we should and continue to push for that goal, we should also really challenge ourselves to ensure that other goals are also progressing. And fundamentally, that that health worker uh, is seen as the, the, the critical linchpin of the entire primary healthcare system, not just for malaria control, but for everything else. So everything should be about those positive incentives for the health worker at the most peripheral level. And, and do you think everything sufficiently is at the moment, or how could it be? How could it be better? You know, I think if we look today at, at the history of polio, um, again, it, it tells a really instructive story. I think we spent a lot of time in polio eradication focused on very vertical programming, and now, and only in recent years, do we start to really ask the question, did we support more routine immunization uh, through those polio resources? And now we're, we're, we're really concerned in polio because we're in the phase of transitioning out of polio, hopefully with eradication pending, and we have to make sure that those polio workers can be utilized for, for uh, uh, other public health uh, causes. And I think very similarly with malaria, we have that opportunity now to, to take a step back, pause with this progress, and say in the next phase, how can we contribute in very concrete ways to a range of other major causes of death of children and, and women, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa? And I, there's, no, there's no one answer to that. It's very much country dependent, as Elizabeth was saying. Mm -hmm. Panel, is there an opportunity cost to focusing on malaria, as opposed to kind of, you know, if you want to focus on malaria, can you at the same time focus on broader health? system strengthening. Um, Elizabeth, maybe in your country, you know, what are the realities of a country like Zambia, so close now, uh, of attempting to strengthen broader health systems as opposed to tackling issues one by one? Well, basically, you still may not avoid tackling issue one by one. At the same time, you have to also look at the broader perspective. I think looking at malaria, as you move towards elimination, you might need specific uh, surveillance systems that are for malaria. In my country, for instance, we have the health information system that collects data every month. For malaria, it may not necessarily be the right way to go because as you go towards elimination, you might need frequent information, maybe on a weekly basis. But we still believe that lessons and strengths of the malaria program can still support the broader uh, system. So we are not saying going parallel system is bad. But we are saying from those lessons and from the strengths that you gain, you can still help develop the broader health systems. Yeah, and then we, when you look at some of the supply chain programs, the human resource training or capacity, it's still the same system that you are using. So you can still develop the broader systems. Uh, I would say integration is important and good, but we have to also look at, uh, as Elizabeth said, the importance of you know building a system with a lens of malaria elimination. Uh, I, as Peter said, it, it all boils down to the frontline health worker, but beyond that, it also involves the community. So for me, it's about community engagement, community empowerment, and grassroots movement to be facilitated and supported by frontline health workers. So when you do social mobilization, particularly grassroots movement, you need agendas that people need to champion. You need agendas that politicians need to champion and come back in a year or two and report to the public that we have done such and such. And the best way to do that for me is, you know, malaria elimination is one such thing. And you will, see, uh, if of all interventions, I'm speaking this as a former minister as well, of all interventions, the one intervention, the one program that people immediately see the impact, politicians immediately appreciate, is malaria. I mean, if you have lived in a malaria endemic country, you see its devastation, you see its impact, you see how people lose lives, how people, you know, be economically deprived because of malaria. 
But when you scale up the interventions, when you sustain it, malaria goes down and everybody appreciates that you know, something has been done to deal with malaria. So I think building those kind of investments and grassroots movements with a lens of repurposing you know, the various tools and investments that we are making to deal with a number of issues is important. So take the community health workers in my country, the health extension workers. They have now become a model for most countries in sub-Saharan Africa. They, we use you know, PMI and global fund resources to build that, that, that infrastructure. It is serving more than malaria. It is serving more than you know, maternal and child health services. We are rolling out you know, a field epidemiology training program. We probably increased the number of epidemiologists, field epidemiologists we have by tenfold over the last five, six years. Much of the investment comes from PMI. And these field epidemiologists are the people that are now dealing with malaria surveillance, but when you face with other you know, uh, diseases of public health importance, they are repurposed to, to be used and uh, to support the system. Supply chain is another example where, you know, malaria affects people in remote settings, right? So you need a system that delivers products everywhere. So if your aspiration is malaria elimination, that means you ensure commodity security throughout the year. And sometimes, you know, you have these malaria seasons immediately for following the rainy season. So you have to have a good you know, system that can pre-position you know, drugs and supplies in time so that when you do not have access to those facilities because of you know, bad roads, people do not die from, from malaria outbreaks. So what I'm saying is, you know, it's really important to have you know, this vision of a malaria elimination. And when we make investments, uh, we, we have to make sure that those investments can easily be repurposed to deal with a number of issues. Yeah. Yeah, just to add on to that, I, you know, you want to, the way you want to deliver malaria services is through the system and not as a separate system as we were talking about. But having malaria as an issue, exactly as Dr. Cassetti said, is an extraordinarily important way to get the kind of commitment we need for malaria. Without the, the attention to issue of malaria, we would not have the President's Malaria Initiative. We would not have had the resources we've had. And you know, last April, the President of Zambia announced elimination. So you don't get that kind of leadership, and you need that kind of leadership to get the attention you do to the issue. The way you deliver it has to be in a way to build the health system as you go forward. But the attention to the issue can't be just ignored, and it's really, really important. And just, uh, Irene, on that point, do you think policymakers who are supportive of the malaria agenda are sufficiently aware of this kind of the knock-on effects, you know, the kind of broader systems strengthening and repurposing the knowledge. I think some are. I think that when you explain it to them in the system, I think they, they get that and they see that as a as a value. Um, I think what has sold them is the idea of you know you've got you know now for over four hundred thousand children dying of something that can be prevented, and that needs to stop. And the way we came to PMI 10, you know, 12 years ago was because there were a million children dying every year from something that was completely preventable. And that's, that was not, that's not acceptable. So I think it's that kind of message and that hook that can bring policymakers in. When you explain that it also builds health systems, I think they're, they're, they like that, but the, the hook is about you can do something about these things. Yeah, I think just to build on, I think that there is more work to be done in looking in governments at ministries of finance. Um, and to the point of Dr. Cassette about domestic financing for these efforts as well and engagement, there, there is more efforts to talk about how these impact and how these strengthen the health systems as well. And, and in key clear messages that a minister of finance would understand. Um, because I think we, we talk a lot about these and there are great experiences and great opportunities and great lessons and knowledge, but I don't know if all parliamentarians and ministers of finance have this information that they need in those bites to be able to use it in their uh, respective roles. So, panel, I wanna get your thoughts on this question before we move to questions from the audience then. How do we keep this at the front of policymakers' minds? I mean, Rebecca, you started us down that path, but 
you know, as you'd already said before as well, as soon as you start seeing positive results, people forget. And that success can, progress can unravel. So panel, how do we keep this at the forefront of policymakers' minds? Are you starting with me or? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, w I would say that it, it takes uh, an all of community, and when I mean community here, I mean global down to an actual physical community, uh, that it takes the governments, it takes um, partners, non-governmental organizations, civil society, private sector, that coming together and addressing these problems as we have seen and, and trying to move forward on malaria elimination. So I do think it takes an all of effort to do this and making sure that people have the messages that they need at their level, so the right messages. Um, as I said, we talk about different successes in, in our language, but how do we package it to make sure that other uh, appropriate line ministries and ministers of finance have this information as well to keep it on the forefront of the policymakers. I think this release of this supplement at a global level is a huge way to keep things in perspective of what an investment has done to date and what incredible progress, but what is still needed um, not to lose that. And I think that's the importance of that constant beat to make sure that we talk about the ongoing efforts that are needed to do this and, and with the right populations. Peter Salama. Uh, Everyone wants to be associated with progress and success, and it's been clearly a successful partnership, the malaria partnership. So I think continuing to tell that story is very critical. I think continuing to focus on that figure of more than 400,000 deaths and how we can reduce that very steadily over time, but also continuing to be realistic and saying, yes, on one hand, there's a group of countries where domestic leadership is going to do the job for us. We have to continue to support those countries. They need continuous funding and technical support. But that's one group. And the other group also needs a dedicated and realistic strategy. How are we going to support the fragile conflict and more vulnerable countries with a realistic plan? What's that's going to, what is that going to require? Because it's going to require something very different in South Sudan to our traditional models. We'll need to involve other partners. Government, of course, is at the center, but other partners will also be absolutely crucial to this, and different types of models will have to be used in those countries. So I think a realistic plan is really important for, for those most difficult scenarios, making the case we can't leave the hardest to last, and we're going to learn from previous eradication and elimination initiatives this time round, and we're gonna leave something very powerful behind, and that's some essential public health and health systems functions that's going to absolutely support a broader range of public health issues uh, beyond uh, malaria elimination. Yeah, I think this is going to be the challenge in the medium to long run, is how do you continue to keep attention and, and the kinds of interventions that are going to be needed to keep malaria numbers down um, over the long run. It's also why it's so important that what we do around malaria is completely integrated into the existing health system, that it's not a separate system that you have to pick up again or, or keep going that, where there's not a lot of malaria cases any longer. But it is going to be a challenge for us to continue the resources and the investments, whether it be through spray campaigns or keep people sleeping under bed nets when their kids aren't getting sick anymore. That's, a, that's going to be a challenge, and I think it's something we're all going to have to, to work on in the future. But how do you keep it in <coughs> policymakers? Yeah. And front. how do you keep it in the policymakers' mind is that, you know, it's, it's part of the evidence that you know, every time we stop paying attention, it comes back. And if we want to prevent future outbreaks of malaria, we need to continue these interventions. And using the science and the data, as, as Rebecca was talking about, become really, really important. I think for me, it's basically making the investment case for malaria, making it more appealing. Yes, it's important to indicate we've been able to half the deaths, we've been able to reduce the illnesses, hospitals are almost empty, but it's also important to show the investment case. I think we've been able to demonstrate that in Zambia, especially when you look at the corporate uh, entities where when they invest in malaria, they've been able to save much more, they have a productive uh, workforce. So then even appealing to our presidents, appealing to our ministers, really making them understand ensuring that the political leadership, the parliamentarians are fully involved in the programs, the traditional leaders. I think really keeping malaria up there, everybody singing malaria, talking malaria, seeing malaria, makes that uh, difference that you really talk about malaria every day. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree. This would be the most challenging uh, 
task for the global malaria community to keep malaria high on the political agenda. My biggest worry is malaria could end up being the, big, the victim of its own success because as you keep on you know, reducing the burden, you know, it's no longer in the top five or top ten uh, list of diseases and people will stop uh, you know, paying attention. And the moment you, you start to do that, it comes back. And when it comes back, as has been said, it comes back with vengeance. So we have to make sure that malaria remains high on the agenda using a number of approaches. And that's one of our priorities at RPM. As I said, engaging with parliamentarians, ensuring that the presidents continue to champion, having you know, in the malaria councils within the countries to make sure that you know, we have critical voices of decision makers and key influencers you know, talking about malaria and so on. But another point which we haven't discussed uh, in this panel is as a global community, we are off track to meet the 2020 milestones. So in, the 20, in 2020, we are supposed to reduce the burden by 40%, diseases by 40%, and eliminate <coughs> malaria in, you know, in 10 countries. The elimination is on track. We probably have more than 10 countries that will interrupt transmission by 2020. But the 40% burden reduction is off track. The 40% days reduction is off track. You know, out of 91 malaria endemic countries, 40 are off track, and 30 of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is also something you know, that we really need to communicate effectively. And we have uh, you know, critical and glaring gaps in terms of coverage, um, be it you know, through IPTP or other interventions. And we have to make sure that that is discussed and people are made aware of that. That would continue uh, to make sure that you know malaria remains uh, high on the agenda. Who's responsible for filling those gaps? What do you want to see happen to make sure that that progress is sustained? Yeah, we have to collectively. I, I, I was going to say the RBM partnership because everyone <laughs> is RBM, but uh, we have to make sure that uh, you know we we work with the countries. Um, in terms of identifying and clearly articulating the investment cases. And you know, we plan to provide that platform for all partners and donors and country through the different engagement platforms we have. You know, the country and the regional support partner committee at RBM is supposed to do this. You know, work with the countries, bring in all the partners, see what the gaps are in, it, in each country, who is doing what, and how can we you know, work collectively to make sure that those gaps are addressed in time before, you know, we face the, the consequences later on. So that's the kind of uh, thing the RBM partnership uh, will do. In fact, in my country now, we are developing a system where the president will be sitting in his office somewhere. He will, he will have a screen and you'll be able to see the progress of malaria as regular as possible as we submit the information. So we are hopeful that we keep them informed and at the Republican president level, he will have that information in his office. Okay, very interesting panel, thank you. Let's get some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a couple of microphones going around. Uh, if I call on you, I'll probably take two or three questions uh, in a go. Uh, please stand up, tell us your name, your affiliation, and then I'd very much appreciate a short question with a question mark. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start with this gentleman here on the back row and then this lady on the back row there. Uh, Bob Nozilia, malaria advocate. Uh, I would just wanted to ask the panel if they could expand on the contributions that the faith-based organizations have played uh, implementing programs as well as how they can uh, help keep policymakers uh, keep malaria at the forefront. Hi, my name is Naoko Kozuki. I'm the Health Research Advisor for International Rescue Committee. I uh, thank you for bringing up the fragile and conflict effective settings. It's very important for us. Uh, the question is, there's a lot of community case management and malaria programs out there, and it's a missed opportunity where, you know, if it's integrated with pneumonia and diarrhea, there's a much bigger bang for your buck in terms of child mortality. 
how, what are the barriers to convincing donors that you know, even if you are a malaria donor per se, that just the, perhaps a minimal addition to, to that funding could bring um, much greater child mortality impact? Okay, so this is actually talking about the kind of knock-on effects that mm -hmm. uh, we sort of mentioned in the panel as well. Is there one more question for now? Otherwise, I'll just you know, get some responses from the, the panel. Okay, panel, let's get those responses. Lady from the IRC, and then Bob, I didn't catch your organization, but Malaria Advocate, you call yourself? Yeah, okay. Um, this question about, you know, how do you convince donors? A little bit more is going to go much, much further. Uh, let's start with... Irene, would you like to start? Yeah, no, I, I, I would because I, I agree and I think that's as we talk about putting malaria within the health system and, and part of the health worker training, it's not just training to recognize fever, malaria fevers, but it's across the board. So I don't think it's actually all that difficult. I mean, it becomes part of the how you program at country level and the discussions you have with the National Malaria Control Program to make sure that's also connecting with the, your child health programs at country level. And I think that's where it can come. But I, I don't think the argument is terribly difficult to make or to accept, certainly from a donor perspective, I can say that, um, that I think that's exactly what needs to happen. And it has to be part of an integrated you know, child health effort um, so that you've got your health worker able to diagnose and treat fever, whatever, whatever the cause is extraordinarily important. And I can just take a first crack at the second question on the faith-based community because I did not mention them at the beginning as a partner, but the faith-based community is an extraordinarily important partner. Absolutely on the implementation side where the, the faith-based organizations have been a major implementer in many, many, many countries and continue to be. And then certainly as part of our broader community and advocate Advocacy here in Washington and in other headquarters, the faith-based uh, community has been extraordinarily important and we really appreciate that and want that to continue, so thank you. Yeah, maybe for the country Zambia in terms of integrated case management, we've actually now changed, although the initials are the same, we are not saying childhood management, we are saying integrated case management. So what we are now doing is that instead of just treat, we are training for malaria, we are training for diarrhea and pneumonia but they are also able to manage the adults as well. And we've had uh, Global Fund support. We are doing integrated case management. The challenge we face is availability of the antibiotic and then the, or, the oral radiation for the diarrhea. But otherwise, we have the diagnostics for malaria. We have the treatments for malaria. So then we are now trying to see how we work with our colleagues so that the treatment is also available for the other uh, treatments. And then looking at the faith-based organizations for Zambia, apart from public health facilities, the other main provider are faith-based. And even when you look at the Global Fund uh, support, we have two principal recipients in my country. So one is the Ministry of Health, the other is the faith-based organization. So we work very closely with them. Okay. <laughs> I, I was just going to add to the to the question about how do you get donors engaged. I think it's even more important is how do you get countries um, to take this on as, as an important um, program for their health of their people. And this is even more important. And as Dr. Chizema mentioned about the integrated management of childhood illness, that was something that was launched with WHO. Um, has really great impact in terms of what could be done, but has never received the funding that it could have been. And I think this is where her points about the return on investments is so important, and not just speaking in the country with the line ministry, but also with ministers of finance, and in thinking about not just in government, but how do you bring the other sectors together on this as well is, is really critical. And, and how do you, you solve the problem together? I think this is an important piece in the accountability of holding um, different states or counties or districts or provinces uh, accountable for this is important. And just on the faith-based organization question, I would just add from the the years of experience with PEPFAR as well with faith-based organizations and building off of that with PMI um, has been remarkable both as, as Iran mentioned in the in the areas of advocacy and the communication but also the delivery of services at the community level um, and, and also being that voice of accountability when they see services or um, maybe provision of materials and nets not coming or diagnostic kits, how they can provide and be an accountable voice to the government as well for this to make sure that services are delivered. You know, to, just to, to really complement the thinking because I think that's exactly the kind of practical approaches we need to identify those practical entry points, whether it's 
community case management, whether it's IPT and immunization linkages, those very practical entry points which allow the malaria interventions to support a broader range of, of public health issues. And I think it, it's not so much the donor community, I think it's more uh, in our imagination as, as, uh, as implementers uh, and also as, uh, as other colleagues have referenced, the way we organize our programs, that they're often the, the silos that, that cause the bottlenecks. But I think most donors, if you said to them, not only will you get a bang for your buck for malaria, but a much broader bang for your buck beyond malaria, uh, are going to really engage in that discussion and be very, very uh, supportive of it. I, I mean, I think all has been said, but I would emphasize the need for building that service delivery platform. Mm -hmm. That's critical. That's where all these programs merge and, you know, provide the support. So we have to make sure that, you know, countries, again, I can't emphasize more the importance of country leadership and country ownership. It's about having the vision to build that service delivery platform that can take on you know different challenges including integration between pneumonia and malaria and other child diseases. Are there any more questions from the audience? One over there from the lady over there on the right. Hi, my name is Sung Hi, Sung Lee from Save the Children. I work on school health and nutrition. I think it's sort of started to touch on it a little bit. It's from very health focus. But when we get beyond closer to elimination, can you talk a little bit more about the the roles of the other sectors? Schools, for example. Let's get some responses to that then. Why don't you start? I think, you know, it is clear that even without reaching the elimination stage, malaria needs a multi-sectoral response. You know, it, malaria is a cause of poverty, and it also is a consequence of poverty as well. So any effort that tries to lift people out of poverty should take the fight against malaria as one of the central strategic initiatives. So it's really important to work across sectors. In fact, this is one of the things we are thinking at RBM, uh, because if you look at you know, the investments in many places, uh, in infrastructure and so on. When you see microepidemics and some case buildups, you see you know these kind of investments that are happening in some parts of you know uh, rural parts of Africa, and engaging the road sector, engaging the tourism sector, engaging the education sector, and all other sectors that are really critical. Uh, to do economic development is going to be important. So the, the vision we have for the RBM partnership is to truly transform the partnership to be a multi-sectoral partnership where we don't go and preach to education why it is important to focus on malaria, but we want the education sector to really come to us as a strong partner and say, you know, we, we have to finish this job because it will have a knock-on effect on, on education performance and so on. So that's the kind of approach we need to, to follow. Others want to chime in? Well, for Zambia, we are also looking at decentralization and ensuring really that the services are right down to the community uh, level. And when you look at the other sectors, this is why even as a Ministry of Health, we have created a new department that is really looking at in, incorporating and collaborating with all other sectors in terms of all the health service areas. In the past, our program was maybe one area just looking at indoor residual spraying, but now we've said we have to be multi-sectoral <coughs> if we have to get the results and the effects that we need. And for now, we are saying transformational agenda in, in Zambia. We are looking at nutrition, education, and all the other areas. Others? I, think, I, I don't have anything to add. I think okay. uh, they said. I'm going to take a little bit of a different twist to this, but I think the one sector, and, and we've alluded to this a bit in terms, but but the research and the science is also so important as you get down towards elimination because you're really going to have to um, refine the tools that you have. The strategies that exist now were once research, 
and we've put them into place. But when there will be resistance that can happen, when we know that reaching certain areas, as, as Peter has mentioned, in some of the fragile states, how are we going to operationalize some of this? We need, we need the science, we need the research pieces of this, and it becomes even more important at that end um, to find those tools that are going to work and take us across the finish line. Okay, panel, I'm going to let you go in two and a half minutes, but I want to get 30 <laughs> seconds from each of you. Now, one last closing thought. The panel is called Achieving a Malaria-Free World. What in 30 seconds each gives you optimism that we can do that and we can do it soon? Rebecca, you talked about science. I think we know what you are. That was going to be my last one. <laughs> 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 the importance of the cont continuity of the science with the program and, and to keep that moving and to, to learn from our science to make sure that we can implement where appropriate, scale up our strategies and implement, and then that cycle goes back in terms of being able to evaluate that and the importance of continuing this work. It is alarm in 30 seconds. Um, optimistic because I think the malaria community understands primary health care and the need to deliver at the most peripheral level, and that makes me optimistic for malaria but beyond malaria as well. Right. No, I'm optimistic because we've seen, and as we've heard from Dr. Gizema, we have tremendous leadership at country level, and that's what's going to make it all work. And we need to just continue doing the kind of thing we're doing, adapting to new tools as they come out of the research pipeline and new issues, but continuing and working with countries and the kind of leadership we're seeing is, makes it all possible. Dr. Gizema. I think for me, we've uh, really looked at the investments that have gone on and we've been able to see the high coverage of our interventions and we are beginning to see reductions in the burden. So we are really sure that we will eliminate, we will achieve the goal. And now really we need the continued support from the PMI and all the other uh, partnerships that we have. Okay. I'm optimistic because political commitment continues to be there, both at, at uh, donor and country level. And I'm also optimistic that we have so many exciting new tools in the pipeline that needs you know, the financial support to, to be scaled up again. And that would put you know, the malaria elimination effect, uh, effort on the right trajectory. OK, panel, uh, audience, I'm going to invite you to say thank you to panel one. Thank you very much. Sir. For contribution this afternoon. While we swap out the panel, uh, please feel free to stretch your legs for two minutes. We'll be back very, very shortly. Thank you.
Well done. Thank you. They're thirsty. I just asked the uh, all right, let's bring water down. <laughs> okay, sorry. Looks like it's a Dana. She's the purple one. Salmon water might be To gather everyone on this. All that you've built, we come to see our Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I could invite you back to your seats for our second panel. We're going to begin momentarily. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats. The second panel is ready and we are waiting to begin. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please take your seats. We are starting imminently. Okay, thank you all very much uh, for your patience, your attention, your contributions in the first half. I hope you'll be equally, um, what's the word, attentive. Second half, we have an excellent panel for you. The panel is entitled Testing, Adapting, Evolving and Growing, and I'm going to hand it over now to Jen Cates, who's the Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation, to be your moderator for this panel. Jen, thank you. Thank you. And Thanks to all the organizers here today for um, letting me be part of this. Uh, and I want to congratulate all of you for coming together on an event and also for the supplement that came out today, um, which our panel will focus a little bit more on, not to get into all of the detail or nitty gritty in there because we encourage you to look at it, but really as a foundation for um, what we're going to try to uh, capture is what's learned from it, why is it important now, um, what, does, what do impact evaluations allow us to do, and kind of where we'll go from here. Um, so let me just tell you who we have on this panel, and then I'm going to, similar to the last panel, I'm going to ask them each a few questions, and we'll have a back and forth, and then we'll go to your questions. And um, you know, we all benefited from hearing the earlier discussion, um, which I think talked more about uh, sort of political movement leadership strategy and we're going to try to bring that now to what what are, how do we connect that to programs and data and evidence um, okay so here is who we have uh, we have dr bernard nalen who is the deputy coordinator of the u.s president's malaria initiative and um, i know all of you know him as well uh, dr patrick ketcher who's the chief of the malaria branch at cdc dr stefan peterson the associate director and chief of the health section at unicef Dr. Regina Rabinovich, who's the president-elect of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. I'm just going to say Dr. Amanda Glassman, <laughs> Chief Operating Officer and Senior Fellow at CGD. Thanks to all of you. So I'm going to start with Dr. Nalen, um, with Bernard, and just uh, generally, um, we heard earlier today, and all of us were, were excited to see the new attention to PMI last week and the announcement by PMI of the expansion. 
Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about it, but also to put that in the context of we know a lot today, um, and how does that inform and allow uh, PMI to make the case really to do an expansion at this time when we know that there's a lot there's sensitivity and challenges around budgets. Um, how how can you how do you connect those? Turn it to you. Yeah, thanks, Jen, and, and thanks to all of you who organized this because uh, it's certainly a, um, not only a celebration of PMI but for the broader malaria control effort and having. Dr. Cassetti from Obak Malaria, our colleagues uh, from Zambia, Dr. Sheath Hayman and others, uh, and all of you in this room who've been involved in this fight over the past 10 or 15 years is uh, really rewarding. And that's actually what I want to sort of go to, like what the supplement actually represents. Um, because it's not PMI, it's about this PMI's contribution to working with all of you to actually be able to get some some concrete ideas mm -hmm. around what's the core data we actually need, how do we go about collecting that data, and then ultimately, at the country level, um, how does that play out when it comes to being able to report with you know, certain confidence intervals around it um, to how these investments in malaria have resulted in improvements of health. I can tell you, and I know many of you in the room with a few gray hairs like mine were involved in this early on, if you go back to like the beginning of rollback malaria or even later, like 2002 when the Global Fund was launched, it was chaotic uh, in the sense that other than knowing we wanted to like reduce the malaria burden to find us cases and deaths, there wasn't a real consensus on what were the core indicators that we actually, I mean countries, I mean there's this famous purple book that WHO put out and I was there so I can take part of the um, blame for this. Um, WHO put out a book uh, called The Purple Book, I'm sure Elizabeth remembers it, that has like pages and pages of indicators. And countries can sort of take these indicators and sort of choose what they want, and that's sort of like what you do. Um, obviously that wasn't good enough. Um, one of the first evaluations of rollback malaria, there was a, a recommendation to ratchet this up a few notches, and that's where rollback malaria launched the Modern Evaluation Reference Group, which many of you have been involved in, which was chaired by WHO and, and UNICEF. And basically what happened, first of all, there was an agreement on a core set of indicators, um, not only cases and deaths, but coverage of some of the key interventions. Some concept of how we would go about collecting those data and improving on what already existed. And also, what does quote unquote impact evaluation look like for malaria. The challenge of malaria, as you all know, is it's very difficult, um, particularly given the fact that 90% of the deaths due to malaria are in young children in Africa, and most of these deaths occur outside the formal health system at home. And secondly, um, tracking malaria-specific data and deaths is very difficult because malaria parasitemia at that point in time was so common that even if you go into the hospital and stick adults' fingers, even if they're dying from something else, they're likely to have malaria parasites on board, many of them. So with the, um, some great work that UNICEF had already been involved in with WHO and the World Bank and others, um, looking at all-cause child mortality and an approach to measuring all-cause child mortality over time, um, I know UNICEF and WHO and the World Bank and others continue to be involved in this, um, which includes all the child health interventions. The all-cause child mortality, we decided in malaria, actually, because malaria not only does it kill kids directly due to malaria, but malaria is also a huge contributor to the indirect mortality, because we all know that the more times a kid is beaten down by malaria, repeated infections with malaria, the weaker they are, their immune systems are weaker, so they're more likely to die from pneumonia yeah, yeah. and from diarrhea and other diseases. So all-cause child mortality was not only measurable, but it also captured both the malaria-specific mm -hmm. and the indirect mortality due to malaria. So that was one agreement that we all came to. Um, secondly, Dr. Alex Rowe at CDC led a, a process which involved just about everybody um, Probably involved Patrick Catcher and others <laughs> when he was a much younger, but it involved the, all the main players in the world of malaria to come up with an agreement on what would impact evaluation actually look like, and that's where we came up with this 
plausibility approach. Hmm. The idea being that, you, I mean, as you know, the, the academics always want to see randomized controlled trials and you have interventions here, you deny interventions there, and then you can show an impact and then maybe eventually you'll, well, that's not ethically robust to say the least um, <laughs> when you're actually involved in scaling up malaria programs. So this plausibility argument, as you probably understand, is, you know, when there are reductions in all-class child mortality, that can be ascribed to what you're doing for malaria. Um, if you're able to show improvements on that, that causal pathway of scaling up interventions and mortality trends while accounting for some of the other contextual factors like climate. I know uh, Dr. Madeline Thompson's here and her article, which is in here in the supplement, um, has continued, they continue to look at climactic factors and of course malaria, that's kind of key for malaria, and also other childhood survival interventions like immunizations and nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the second level of agreement, the sort of approach to the plausibility. And then investing in the data collection systems. And again, UNICEF had already through the malaria indicator cluster surveys, these population-based surveys, um, the demographic health surveys that were going on in many countries, Robeck Malaria um, developed the Malaria Indicator Survey to help plug some of those intervals between times. And there was a big effort to standardize those questions and approaches and the data outputs for that to the point that today you can actually, not only are these, without that standardization, it would be very difficult to talk about in-country or inter-country or now at the global level, as you know, any of you can go on website and access these data and do your own analysis if you like. And then of course some, some idea of what is going to be needed for the actual routine health systems, like what should they be concentrating mm -hmm. on. So in my case, I know I'm a bit prejudiced, I think that's a good case story that other global health programs can also learn from, that it's very difficult once you start doing stuff to go in and say, well, if we'd only done this, if we had done this, um, we, are, we lost that opportunity to do that. I think there was, uh, because of the efforts of many people in the room, malaria's done much better than that, so we're actually able to, I think, fairly um, consistently report on progress, and that, that gets into this important point of feeding these information back to policymakers in a way that, with credibility, that we're not sort of making things up, mm -hmm. and that's driven the ongoing U.S commitment to funding, and I'm sure that Elizabeth and others at the country level can also show how important that's been at the country level. So my point is this whole partnership around the data collection, this and that, we obviously the other thing the supplement points out, there's some ways going forward that we're going to need to change some of what we're doing as some countries have reduced malaria to the point where this monitoring deaths is no longer going to be the most dynamic thing going forward. But still, in these 13 countries that still account for 75% of the cases and deaths, um, I think we will probably continue this present model. So I'll just stop there. That Again, this isn't just about us. It's about the, the broader community and what's happened. Thank you. Um, Patrick, this might be a good uh, follow-on sure. to some extent. Um, one of the things that's talked about in the supplement, and I think uh, Bernard was just getting at it, was um, uh, and it was mentioned in the first panel, was the use of surveillance mm -hmm. itself as an evaluation mechanism or tool to inform mm -hmm. uh, impact. Could you talk about that specifically? Sure. And maybe this gets at what you were just alluding to, that there are new, we have to think about this differently um, mm -hmm. as we go forward. Right. Um, maybe I'll take a, a moment first, though, to acknowledge the authors of the papers who are here in the room. If those of you who contributed a paper either as a first author or a contributing author or one of the implementing partners would uh, raise your hands so we can uh, see who's here and really acknowledge the tremendous work. This is their reward, um, having, <laughs> having this recognition, but also uh, seeing their work really matter is their reward. They're not expecting uh, to get a tenure nod on the basis of this work. Really? None of them are expecting a call from uh, the Nobel Committee next week. Um, but they definitely have done science in the public interest, and that's a really important uh, 
uh, contribution that they've made on our behalf. It helps us as public servants be more certain that the investments that we're making uh, meet international standards uh, of delivering on the promises that, that uh, we've made. Um, I think that there are some lessons uh, from the work that uh, some of which uh, uh, Bernard has already pointed out. Um, and one we heard people come around to again and again on the first panel is the, the potential importance of pivoting towards more use of routine surveillance data uh, as an auxiliary tool in addition to monitoring the coverage of our key interventions and looking at uh, malaria parasitemia burden and all-cause mortality. Um, it becomes increasingly important for us to be able to look at, uh, at trends in confirmed malaria cases for several reasons. First of all, we've already made a public investment uh, on the part of our endemic countries and on the part of uh, our partner uh, support in procuring rapid diagnostic tests to improve our ability to distinguish malaria from other causes of, of febrile illness. I think we're really getting our money's worth there in that it helps us to do a better job of targeting our anti-malarial drugs where they're needed. Uh, it saves on uh, overusing anti-malarial drugs. But there's also another potential economic benefit we haven't yet completely realized. And that's capturing the information that that test creates. Not only does it give us an opportunity to know when and where malaria cases are occurring, if we track it long enough and develop confidence in the trends that we see, it will let people like Dr. Chizema know when and where a, a problem might be occurring and where more resources need to go sooner rather than later. Um, it also helps us understand what's not malaria. And it may unmask mm. uh, a trend in uh, non-malarial febrile illness that could help people like Peter Salama understand, hey, there's really something serious happening up here in Borno State that isn't malaria. We wouldn't have seen it if we just assumed every child with fever needed treated for malaria. There is an opportunity for us to be able to use surveillance data in a way that helps us be more responsive and more efficient with the tools that we have available. Um, when we set out to, uh, to program with countries their new global fund grants and later to work with, uh, with PMI in the high burden countries, and certainly in some of the countries that are coming online in West Africa, the approach was pretty simple. There was such desperate need everywhere that we needed mosquito nets and treatment drugs everywhere. Um, we've now reached a point where uh, we're developing uh, better surveillance systems and uh, real-time reporting capabilities that will let us be a little bit more, uh, that, that will give us another paintbrush or two to be able to approach our work with. And so we don't uh, necessarily have to go out with the same approach everywhere. We can begin adapting even in some higher burden places, not, not just wait until, uh, until areas are approaching elimination, but there may be some, uh, some gains to be made in developing those systems and looking at how we can reach high burden areas more effectively and more efficiently with the tools and the interventions that we have available. So thank you. Thanks, and thanks to the author. Congratulations to the authors. Um, there's a lot of you here. That's great. So if we have technical questions, we'll come to all of you. Um, I want to go to Stefan uh, to ask, um, picking up on other themes that came out in the, in the supplement, um, and also earlier on the first panel, was this issue of integration mm -hmm. um, and the importance of integration, but understanding what that means and what we learned from the supplement on that point. Do you want to? Thank you very much. There? In fact, to illustrate that point, I came with my ID badge today that lets me into the office in New York, but I wanted to show you the backside of it. It says parent, and it lets me into my child's school. <laughs> and, and I'm a father of four uh, that we've raised in Uganda and Sweden. And, and growing up, they, they invariably had fever, typically in the middle of the night, and I believe 5.88 times per year, isn't it? 
<laughs> Where are the authors when you need them? Eh? Uh, now, we, we had a provider, be it in Sweden or Uganda, around the corner who would diagnose this uh, uh, and actually say that most of the time it was viral, be it Uganda or Sweden, that it was otitis, that it was occasionally one or two times, I remember pneumonia, and once, only once, malaria. So I would go home with paracetamol, antibiotic or anti-malarians, and I would feel that, yes, integrated care gave my kid the best care the kid needed, and it helped me as a parent. So uh, that's sort of the, the lead into this. Now, turning to the front side of this badge, I, of course, worry about particularly high mortality countries, and it's great to see PMI expanding into West Africa because that's really where my biggest headache day to day is uh, finishing off that. And uh, as alluded to by Pete and others, it's also increasing in the concentrated. And, and I'm sure you follow your Twitter feed so that you've seen the five by five kilometer mortality maps coming out of IHME this week, which I, I think it will be an interesting way of, of actually taking this to the next step. So, Looking at integrated care models, I think it not only helps the kid, the customer, the febrile kid, and it's also about responsiveness to parents' needs. And I think it's also increasingly indispensable, Elizabeth, in the malaria elimination, because how many times can you test the kid and say, congratulations, your child does not have malaria, and say bye-bye? I think that's sort of a losing game, as I think we heard in the first panel. The second point I wanted to make is on integrated care, that the rapid diagnostic tests Patrick uh, referred to now, uh, we now have good evidence both from clinical studies, Heidi Hopkins' paper the other week, and also from uh, actually a census of, of all the Malawi um, first-line health facilities, that once the RDT is negative, a majority of kids get the antibiotics. And two out of three we were able to show across uh, Malawi unnecessarily so and unjustified. We switched from presumptive treatment with antimalarials to diagnostic, malaria diagnostic guided presumptive treatment with antibiotics, which then is not only bad quality of care in most of these cases, it's a precious uh, waste of resources, both in terms of money, but even more so in terms of efficacy, drug efficacy which is a public good, just like clean air. And once we lose it, we don't have it. Uh, and I think that applies to antimalarials as well as antibiotics, uh, and uh, not to speak of TB, et cetera. So I think there's good reasons why we need that integrated care to make sure that all the drug use is rational, and that we're not moving problems from one disease to the next, uh, as it were. And I think this will also help us address such integrated care an area which is very hot, top of my list, which keeps me awake at night. Our consistent failure to make progress on one million kids dying from pneumonia per year. That number is stuck, and it has been stuck. And they die for failure to access a 42 cent antibiotic, amoxicillin, which we now even have in, in much better formulation. So I, I, I think drawing on the strong malaria community and what you've built up in integrated care model is a way to do this. But Yay. Uh, these kids are going to be hard to reach, and they're going to be far away, and they're going to be isolated uh, and whatnot. So it's also about reaching, and we actually have evidence data that parents, at least in my Ugandan past uh, and studies when I was a university professor, parents were ready to go one mile. So I'd like to talk about the first mile health system. The one that you find within one mile of your door when your kid has a high fever in the middle of the night or you wait till the next morning. So who's there? And we're now pushing very much what we call a, a community health system with a frontline health provider, be it a paid community health worker or someone who works in a private sector uh, outlet or other and seeing how we can improve the quality of what they do. And that this community worker, frontline health worker, be backed up as an extended arm of a strong primary healthcare system with the supplies, with the supervision, but also feeding back the data that can form time series, uh, as, as we just heard, uh, and be backed up with referral backup as well. So the community health system, I think, and it was just, it is an integral thing to elimination and acceptable elim elimination. It was just endorsed by 26 countries in Addis Ababa in the other week, uh, community health workers as extended arms of primary health care. 
Um, and that will serve not mala only malaria elimination and make uh, kids and parents better happy, but also serve surveillance purposes, uh, I think, as we alluded to. Had we had strong community health systems in West Africa, I think the Ebola epidemic would not have gone as far as it did before we picked it up. And thirdly, my final point, Jane, is to say that there's an evidence base also in delivery system. You can research delivery systems. Uh, and uh, there's something called implementation research or delivery science if you work for, for the bank. And we're trying to collaborate and push that much more. Embedded research in programming. Fix the plane as you're flying it rather than wait for the crash end line evaluation as we've often been doing in, in the past, uh, I think, in public health. And in particular, Regina, I'd like to challenge you that <laughs> when you next put up this, su this supplement, can't you actually look at some of the failures, as it were, verbal and social autopsies. Uh, I happened uh -huh. to meet Rene Salgado uh, a long time ago, and we, st we, we looked at, at the time, social autopsy, and we looked at referral quality of care. Sorry you lost your child, what led up to this loss? And I have long, long stories and endless piles of sad social autopsy stories of ha kids having been identified mistreated with antimalarials when they should have had antibiotics and vice versa, reaching a hospital and expiring for lack of blood or oxygen. So let's research delivery systems as well and, and put out a supplement on that. Uh, yeah. Suggestion. Got the it. authors are here and ready. Right? Yes, this you. is the person you want to talk to if you want ideas for the next, for the next one. Um, thank you. As a parent of an under five-year-old, I appreciate your... The, 5.88 times? Um, uh, well, that's about right, yeah. 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 Um, hopefully, unfortunately not this morning, though. Okay. Um, so Gina, just to turn to you, and I think this picks up nicely, um, just remind all of us here why impact evaluations are so important. I mean, what are they, and that's a very general question, so really take, take run with it how you want to, but um, I think it's pretty uh, remarkable that we are sitting here with the supplement and other data that have come out relatively recently to show real impact. When, as Bernard said, when this all started, it was a little bit of, we know we have to do something, what is it going to be? And actually now we can come back and have an evidence base that's quite significant. Um, so uh, please champion that for us, but also your thoughts on, on maybe what's next or what's not, what's not yet accomplished in this, in this realm. Impact evaluation for, for a program uh, is the, the compilation of of what happens with a child, right? But it's writ across a country, writ ac measured across multiple countries, and how do you know? How do you believe it? And um, you get really challenged. Are you doing the right thing? I was fascinated by um, Dr. Chisema talking about that, that, um, that screen in which her minister is looking much more frequently because I was taught pretty early on um, that if you don't count, you're just practicing. Mm -hmm. We're here to count. Mm -hmm. And we've made pretty good progress when it comes to deaths. And you could say that almost anywhere, but really, 450,000 deaths, we have a ways to go. And I think the other number that struck me was the 212 million cases. Mm -hmm. So. PMI and MASEPA and, and launching and reviving the malaria program a decade ago was really about dealing with a global emergency. A global emergency in which there wasn't a lot of credibility that number one, it could be done, we'd forgotten, the data was there, that, that it could be done and that if it was done that you would actually have impact. So it's lovely to take a deep breath this time and measure that impact and, and to talk about it. Um, and every, all the questions that we get faced with at country level are, are in that supplement. Everything from last year was a dry year, now we have the rain, then we have the rains, malaria went up, is it the failure of our interventions, is it the rains? Mm -hmm. These are questions that we get asked. Is it resistance? So malaria reflects everything that's happening in the country. Um, and uh, it reflects it pretty rapidly. I used to call it, and I, I guess I'll just talk about it, is it's the parakeet in the gold mine of global health because mm -hmm. if you let off the pressure in 12 months, predictably, you're going to have cases, you're going to have epidemics, you're going to have resurgences, and it's been very interesting watching countries 
rise to the occasion and say, no, we're not going to do this again. I think the, the best example was Sri Lanka, which saw mm. from 18 cases to 100,000, said no thank you, and they eliminated. And they did that with current tools. So there's huge credibility to the fact that good treatment, good prevention, surveillance to tell you where the cases are and where to respond actually works. And it works in a variety of places. It is most challenged in Sub-Saharan Africa. So whether it is how to crash the population of, of parasites or how to go from low to zero, mm. I think Africa really does challenge us. And um, what, what evaluation does, it, it gives us a read on, on, where, on how, how we're doing, but it also reminds us of where we need to go so that we're able to untangle the effect of lack of education, lack of treatment, and the, synthesis, the symbiotic relationship between pneumonia, diarrhea, and malaria uh, in terms of mortality, but also um, take a step back and say, where are we going with cases? Mm. And for anyone, and I was there at the place actually, to even begin to talk about the concept of elimination, for a disease that has, at that point, was supposedly mm -hmm. 240 million cases, it was, um, you could have heard a pin drop in the room because how crazy were we to say, this is great, but if you go forward, you need to have an end game, and the end game in malaria has to be the elimination strategy. Yeah. There's a beautiful paper, too, that I'm going to talk about that weren't in the, the series, but I think reflect the kind of thinking that we need to have. Um, this one was done that looked at what happened in every country that got down to very low. And if they eliminate it, it's remarkably stable. And if they didn't, they got down to the 18, 18 cases, 80% plus resurged. So there's, as we're heading forward, we need to do that with our eyes open, with focus of resources, with mm. management of systems to be able to achieve that. Mm. The second paper is actually published by the Center for Global Development. I love this paper, and it's old. I bet you all these new people here haven't seen it. Go back, 2005. Mm -hmm. And it's the report the Center for Global Development calls report from the What Works Working Group. And there was such skepticism in 2003 <laughs> that the question was, yes, okay. The question was, I was is it going that. to work? <laughs> and they did, they looked at 100 case studies of scaled interventions, which is what PMI and the countries have engaged upon and is part of what we're living in malaria right now. Mm. And they said, what made a difference? So I'm back to PMI, leadership. Thank you, Dr. Zemer. Thank you, Dr. Nayla. And your staff, I was just in Mozambique last week and just impressive, the thinking and the courage to do evaluation at a country level of a treasured intervention to say, are we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. What are the trade-offs? What else should we mm -hmm. be doing? So it takes a certain amount of courage to do evaluation because you're asking questions for your treasured, most where you're most committed. And you've got to be willing to do that because we've got to improve mm -hmm. what we're doing to be able to reach the end goal. That actually sets up Amanda perfectly yes. to bring us Thank up you. to date with what works, but also your, um, if, if you haven't read the blog that Amanda put out in advance of this uh, event, which kind of ties together some of the top line themes from the supplement and this issue of rigorous evidence and evaluation and independent evaluation. So I'll, I'll read I mean, this. actually, the, there are two versions of Million Save. There was the one from 2005, and then there's this one that we put out in 2015. And actually, the one in 2005 does not include a malaria evaluation program because what malaria, I would say at that time, the malaria, the malaria programs have always been the best at documenting service delivery. So when I look at it in contrast to HIV AIDS or TB, you know, a lot of times what we see is that we're modeling what we see in the field based on the amount of stuff we're buying. Hmm. Malaria has always gone downstream and looked at what was happening at the service hmm. delivery unit. I really admired the end use verification tool, for example, that PMI has used so long. But what Million Saved was looking for was not just were the interventions provided, were the cases of malaria detected, but did that have an impact 
on mortality or incidence um, and all-cause child mortality, mm -hmm. which we now know from your working group uh, is, is the right way to look at this issue. And I think we now, you know, even since this book was written, we included the Zambia program as an example of a program that had an incredible amount of documentation and, and surveillance that allowed you to say, using those plausibility setups, that we were having an impact on mortality. But today with the supplement, in addition to another paper that was published in PLOS, um, we can now say something more about the attributable impact mm -hmm. of the PMI program on malaria outcomes. So mm -hmm. congratulations. That's something that happened between you know, two years ago mm -hmm. and today. The mm -hmm. level of evidence is, is, is just an order of magnitude difference. And it's really important because it's not just rain, as you say, or resistance. It's also economic growth. We're working in countries that are growing enormously their housing conditions are changing, the, their exposures are changing, and we really need to understand how, if we're going to use the money the best way we possibly can, how those living condition changes, how those environmental changes are, are playing into what we see in terms of the effectiveness of programs. Um, I also wanted to say something uh, about another reason to continue to focus on evidence, and I really like the points about surveillance and administrative systems, program systems, to understand what's happening. Um, there is a study that has been looking at what we call allocative efficiency. How within a program, whether it's malaria or HIV AIDS, what's the mix of interventions, given the budget we have available, that has the mm -hmm. biggest impact on mortality? And these authors are finding that with the same money we spent in 2015, we could have saved 12,000 more lives by deploying interventions in a different mix and targeting it to different geographical areas. So that's, I think every speaker in the earlier panel also talks mm -hmm. about that, but that's a really practical use mm -hmm. of evaluation surveillance data, and I think I'd like to see that everywhere in global mm -hmm. health. So I also wanna add my congratulations to the authors and also especially to Erin Eckert, who helped us learn a lot about malaria programs and their evaluation, and, and we really thank her and the Zambia program for helping us with this publication that's also outside if you'd like to learn more about it. Thanks. Great. So I have a couple of general questions for you for yeah. anyone who wants to take them before we get to your questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we heard in the first panel was this issue, I think I'll, I'll, it was framed as what, is, what are we going to leave behind mm -hmm. and how, that, how important that is. Um, but also I would add, and it comes up in, in HIV and PEP for all the time, this um, challenge of talking about vertical interventions and what the, their effect is on the underlying system. Are mm -hmm. they taking from the system or are they giving to the system? And there's been various studies in, in the PEPFAR context that have evidence a little bit both ways. Um, are you aware of uh, impact evaluations or evaluations underway that have been able to pick up that effect yet? It came up so often in the prior panel that can show what we all kind of intrinsic, intrinsically know, that the, the, the um, tremendous investment of PMI and Global Fund and others is having these knock-on effects. Has that, do you feel like that has been assessed or could be assessed more directly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I, I think yes, it can be assessed. I don't think we've because we've been focused yeah. so much mm -hmm. on the burden reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, we continue, and there are a lot of data out there. We continue to miss opportunities mm -hmm. to actually look at the benefits to the overall health system. Um, so first of all, just to remind people, and Lorraine sort of referred to this in PMI when we train health workers, it's not around malaria case management. It's around IMCI mm -hmm. when we train antenatal care workers mm -hmm. to benefit malaria and pregnancy, it's actually on the whole focused antenatal care. You know, when we fund programs to have supervisors to go out to these community health workers and see what's going on, that's not malaria specific. So the malaria funding, about 40% approximately of the overall envelope goes to commodities, the rest goes to these systems mm -hmm. issues, laboratory strength, et cetera, et cetera. And some of this, we also look for opportunities to collaborate with other programs such as PEPFAR, for example, around the laboratory. The rollout of DHIS2, which is taking place in many countries now, that's, a lot of that's being funded by the Global Fund, PEPFAR, and PMI. Dr. Cassetti pointed out that the, the, the 30,000 health extension workers that were rolled out <laughs> to deal with remote communities and, and less remote communities in Ethiopia, a lot of that funding came not only from the government, which would have been challenged to do that by itself, but also using resources to fight these three major diseases. Um, so I continue, and again, I, I 
think we can all blame ourselves. You know, if you go to Zan Zanzibar, every time you go there, the PS or the program manager will take you to a health facility and say, you know, eight, nine years ago now, I mean, before it was like two or three years ago, there were two or three kids to a bed on this pediatric ward, and now half these beds are empty. Mm -hmm. That data's there. Do we bother to put it together? Do we actually bother mm -hmm. to? And I just yeah. continued to scratch my head like, um, I mean, I think going forward, we need to do more of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In PMI, we did fund one study in Zambia, in southern Zambia, where malaria has been controlled not only significantly, but they're pushing towards elimination, looking at savings to hospitals now that you don't have beds being taken up by people with cerebral malaria. I think we can and should do more of that to make the case going forward that, first of all, malaria is not, I mean, there are some things about malaria that will continue to be vertical. IRS is vertical. You don't want health workers to be running around doing IRS. Um, and that's just, but when it comes to case management, when it comes to procurement supply chain, when it comes, these things are not vertical and we contribute to that. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say one last thing, as we push towards elimination, there will be a few things that people will, that will be malaria specific. Because mm -hmm. when you're dealing now with, in Zambia and an area where you're trying to eliminate, when you have a case of malaria identified because you've improved your surveillance system, there's a whole other set of activities to go out to communities to go stick fingers or do mass drug administration or, or mm -hmm. other things, or, and that's gonna be kind of malaria specific. But in the interim, mm -hmm. you know, getting there, I, I know my, I don't think I'm just prejudiced, I'd like to hear what others think. I think the investments in malaria are helping to improve the overall systems which mm -hmm. should benefit mm -hmm. the other diseases. Yeah, sure. jump in, please, step on. Yeah. I don't want to enter into comparison between different programs, but I think you're doing well, Bernard, at the PMI and the malaria community. Uh, and I think we need, as you rightly said, both vertical and horizontal and diagonal, because depending on, on what it is. Mm -hmm. But I would like to challenge all of us, though, to make sure that we actually collectively find the missing pieces. Because the fact that even with the system's investments benefiting the febrile mm -hmm. child, one million kids continue dying per year from pneumonia for lack of a simple antibiotic. I think that's sort of a failure collectively of the domestic and international communities in addressing that. And I agree the systems are in place, but actually we need to take responsibility for the customer, the eventual mm -hmm. customer there. Uh, so yes, I think it is, but we also need to go that extra mile. And that's not just to, uh, to bang you, bang mm -hmm. your head, Bernard, here, mm -hmm. but uh, all of our heads, because we're failing mm -hmm. to do that presently. Right. I think, too, I, uh, people talk about vertical and horizontal, even diagonal programs. I like to think of them as T-shaped, right? All of our efforts have a vertical component that is specific to our malaria work, but they reach out across sectors and interface with other system elements. At a moment like this, where we're taking stock of what we've accomplished, where we're entering the sustainable development agenda era with its better emphasis on integration and its, and its less specific e emphasis on verticality, it's an opportunity for us to do some upper body work and build up those, <laughs> uh, those parts of our, our components. You know, 40% of our, our investments in the multilateral sector, if 40% are in commodities, that means 60% are in those elements that have, have multi-use potential. And if we look beyond what PMI and the Global Fund, the international partners are contributing, and really look at what the countries themselves are contributing to, their, to the overall malaria commitment, their support turns out to be 80% mm. systems and 20% specific interventions. Dr. Cassetti called for countries to take on more of the financing to reach that $102 billion uh, price tag of, of the uh, global technical strategy and the action and investment plan. Um, as that happens, as countries take on more, we're, it, it is expected and hoped that, that uh, their uh, investments will overwhelmingly be in the system side. Yeah. If I could, I mean, I just want to go back to something Gina said. and. Even though where I come from, it was a canary in a coal mine, uh, not a parakeet in a coal mine. You can have a canary. <laughs> <laughs> I think particularly in the African setting, 
malaria is a perfect thing to work on for anyone who's interested in reaching remote mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. the poorest of the poor, frequently beyond the extent of the health system until you end up having a community-based platform. Malaria is a great thing to work on because, uh, as many people pointed out, if things aren't working well, I mean, things can be working well, and then if they're not working well, you don't need to wait a few years to figure out that something's not going well. You start seeing some negative impacts immediately, whether that's because the health workers aren't doing their job or the drugs aren't where they should be or the bed nets didn't arrive. So again, I think all of us, you know, all of us who work in malaria are not, we're, it's not only about malaria, it's really about the whole system's issues, but I think malaria itself can help demonstrate what needs to happen to get there. There's no better disease, if you want to build up community systems to actually do something and deliver something, and again, I, it's great that your kids didn't have malaria when they stuck their fingers, but if you'd been out in these rural areas and had a finger, finger stuck five times, you may have had five positives. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that people now can go, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, not wait till their here, here. health facilities open. If it's a weekend, they may not be open. They don't have to travel miles. The fact that they can actually go, well, we have tools now, the rapid diagnostic test. Someone can go to their neighbor who's been trained, get their finger stuck, and the drugs are there. Here, here. There's no better disease to actually start rolling out that program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did, Gina, did you want to say? I did, I wanted to, to make two comments. The first is, as, as we enter problem solving mode, how do we, okay, we've done great, we've had impact, you can measure it, you can do that analysis, how do, where do we go from here? And part of that is scale, mm -hmm. how do you get to places you couldn't get to before, how do you work in border areas, mm -hmm. countries, and, and where there's a lot of hope. Ebola gave me a lot of hope to watch Nigeria mm -hmm. tackle that problem as a public health priority mm -hmm. and deal with it. That was amazing. And I just think if they really paid attention to malaria, they could advance so much. Um, and I know hundreds of millions of bed nets have been distributed there, but given the endemicity and the um, vec high vectorial capacity uh, in West Africa, that remains a challenge. And so part of the solution is a problem-solving one. Hmm. Some of them can be little mm -hmm. problems. How do you get A to B? How do you get hmm. access? How do you improve systems? And the others are one, so little innovations that need to be thought about all the time where mm. there needs to be a culture of innovation mm. in the program itself saying, my job is not to just implement what I did yesterday, it's to improve it. Mm. But the second is, is big innovation. And, and by that I mean bringing the best science to bear. There are some very exciting things happening at the level of the mosquito and ways of thinking about new drug combinations and even though, you know, I've worked on this before, but, you know, the hope of a potential transmission blocking vaccine, we're going to need some of these and parallel investments in that area need to be made. Um, and part of that, and it, actually I'm bringing it up, not only because I worked on it, but it includes mm -hmm. health systems. The Good. Malaria Eradication Scientific Alliance has just done uh, a malaria refresh to look at the research mm -hmm. agenda. There were six panels, and one of them was health systems. Mm -hmm. Because realization that, yes, you need to deal with resistance, you need to deal with residual transmission. We've got mm -hmm. a measurement challenge. We're now better aligning, but we still, what are we measuring and why, and how do we use those data? But one of them was health systems, in which we've watched some amazing changes happen. Not only the health extension workers, but the, the, the financing scheme that Mexico did that transformed their healthcare system. So there's definitely ways of thinking about it from primary health care and from, from the child center perspective, not only mm. of deaths, but of the cases in the community here, here. to actually be able to do a better job. Mm. And so I, I think the way forward is, is sort of big eye and also little eye. Mm. Innovation that, that has people solving the problems they are facing in their everyday work. Mm. Great. Did you want to add? Can I add to that? I, mean, I think we should. Questions. Very well put. I'm very happy. But I think, in addition, we should look at the dead parakeets and dead canaries as well. <laughs> because yes. failures, be it a severe malaria case, a severe pneumonia case, or, or forbid, heaven forbid, a dead kid, 
there, that, those are the failures of our control efforts, and that's where we can learn. It's good and well to actually look at it from the supply side and make sure that all the things get to be there in place and at the right time, etc. But can you actually analyze our failures and our near failures, as we do in health facilities with audits? Can we do a community audit? I laugh because I've tried to do that, mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. are really loath to talk about their mm -hmm. own yes. work as, as a failure. Mm -hmm. So yes. there, there has to be a language to do mm -hmm. that, whether yeah. it's mm -hmm. the, the panel and public-private partnerships, what's a, great, mm -hmm. what's a great partnership, what's a failed partnership, what can we learn mm -hmm. from those, mm -hmm. to programming on the ground. It's just mm -hmm. really hard for people to, to wrap their heads around that. Mm -hmm. But the yeah, paper I never so. managed to write, if I may. That's there you go. In the next, uh, you have to day. write it. Uh, million saved. Another aspect of it is that it has four cases of disappointment. These are programs that implement well, that evaluate rigorously, but don't achieve health goals. And so looking at the reasons mm -hmm. why that happens, I think, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. But let's not call it failure, because right. it wasn't a failure. Right. Everything was implemented the way that right. they wanted right. to. Right. It's just that we didn't get the result that we hoped for. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing uh, has to do with it's, it's related to this integration issue, but this is really about efficient service delivery in any given country setting. And that, I think it's very ethical to do some you know, very rigorous impact evaluation. What is the delivery platform? What are the set of resources that you could put out for that gets the services as efficiently as possible to the populations in need? And, and that's, that's where we are now, especially as countries start to talk about universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. Uh, what sometimes happens in the transition to universal health coverage is that the vertical public health programs, they become weak, they don't have a constituency, they're over here, they're less important. Sometimes that doesn't matter so much because things are getting so much better in other ways that they're not as, it's not as significant, but I think it's, it's a real, it's something to watch out for. When I look at Latin America and what's happened with public health, I'm really worried. Um, and look at, look at what happened in Venezuela, right? Uh, that's for other reasons, but the point is, uh, you know, I think you can rigorously evaluate service delivery um, and look at these integration programs where it makes sense. I agree. I don't want to see primary health care workers doing IRS. That's a bad idea. That just seems like ex ante. I don't have to evaluate it. But <laughs> okay. You. So why don't we go to your questions? We have about ten minutes, mm -hmm. and we have a hard stop for one of our panelists at three. Yes, over here, and we'll take more than one at a time. Yeah, in the front. There's another. Wonderful panel. Thank you so much. I was wondering, I didn't hear Can anything. Can you just say who you are? And... Oh, okay. I am Noah Samara. I'm the chairman of a company called Yasmi that has a satellite over Africa that communicates directly to tablets without necessarily uh, needing the internet, in fact, obviating the need for the internet or for electricity. My question to the panel is in your, in your thinking about these various solutions, has there been some kind of thinking about the use of technology, particularly communications mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. in a very strategic way to leverage human resource by training the human resource to deal with the problems that, that they have at the local level, whether it's community health workers or, or the, the public at large? What kind of thinking has been going on in terms of leveraging technology itself, or, or rather using technology to leverage yeah. Yeah. the local human resource. Thank you, and then there was another question in the back. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just wait for the mic and please let us know who you are. Thank you, um, my name is Michael McDonald, a former entomologist with PMI. I'm glad to hear the word mosquito mentioned earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> but following up on the issue of uh, innovation and coming back to Peter's issue of complex emergencies, we have many situations. We have North Kivu, we have dengue in Yemen, we have South Sudan, Uganda. We have many situations where our traditional LLINs and IRS is not feasible. How can we as a community innovate to find out spatial repellents, treated blankets, uh, other means of vector control for these very vulnerable populations, which are only going to grow over the next few years? So how can PMI, UNICEF come together OFDA, UNCR, <coughs> really address these humanitarian emergencies that need the innovation to address these situations. Great, so why don't we start with those. Um, oh, actually, one more, there's one more back there. We'll take our third question. We might, that might put us over time anyway, so, yeah. 
Hi, Margaret McDonald with the UN Foundation. And I wanted, on the topic of evaluation, I was curious to see what impact have we seen thus far around the expansion of the Mexico City policy? Or and is there a plan sort of in place um, to evaluate that on a regular basis? So knowing that it's where it's expanded um, to include all global health programs. Um, so curious if that's been looked at in terms of an evaluation process. OK, so we have the three questions. One was the use of technology. The other one was complex emergencies and capturing some of the working across sectors to, to address. Um, and the third was Mexico City policy expansion impact. So who wants to start with what? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that the technology piece, yeah. which I'm not an expert at, but I'm watching uh, a, a number of pieces come together. Mm. There's nothing like being in Ghana on sec off, away from a secondary city in mm -hmm. a very rural, very, very rural, uh, actually it was a Catholic hospital, so it's a mission hospital and sitting there and talking to the moms and asking, who has a cell phone? Thinking no one has a cell phone. Maybe Jen and there's enough people in that village yeah. that have a cell phone that they're wired. Mm -hmm. They're wired, they can report, they can figure mm -hmm. out how to get information that before they couldn't. So there's an information flow in Africa that has made, mm -hmm. a, has leapfrogged over wired, wired technology and we all, we're all aware of that. But, the kind of surveillance systems that you're, you're, we're thinking about right now include how you turn that into mapping, what it is that you're collecting, um, and they're using cell phone technologies for reporting so that you're not carrying pieces of paper that have to go to some place then then to be tabulated, mm -hmm. never to be looked at again. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it is in some ways information rich and in some ways, it's just burgeoning right now with the availability of, of technologies to, to transmit information, collect information. And I think we're just beginning to see the beginning of how that transforms surveillance, which is capturing the data on cases, but then how we respond to it. And that can be very nuanced at the, at the country level. Yeah. Thank you. An illustration of, of your question here in front. I don't know if you saw it in Mozambique last week, but community health workers in Mozambique are now being equipped in a project we do with many partners with cell phone technology, which on the one hand is a decision support when they see a kid with mm -hmm. fever. It also reports back to the data system. It takes care of logistics issues, etc. And they can actually call for free and talk to their supervisor or their colleague. So we see that as one way of trying to sort of help strengthen human resources uh, using such technology. Something that does excite us very much, though, is the potential actually to go forward to more social accountability mechanisms so that I could actually poll you in this room, what did you really think of this panel? And you don't have to stand up and challenge me and say, your, your contribution was useless, Steph, and you can sort of type it in somehow. Can we build social accountability mechanisms, social contracts, two-way social contracts uh, via uh, this type of technology innovation as well. Okay. The other two questions, or this one? I mean, just on the issue of technology, I think this is another area for evaluation, right? If we want health systems to adopt really cost-effective technologies that are going to be transformative, let's test it rigorously. And I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've uh, seen uh, in Uganda, for example, they had so many M Health initiatives that the government actually put a freeze on new introductions because uh -huh. it was too much. Right. And if all of us are going to government and saying, I have these 25 swell gadgets, you know, pick one, how will they decide? So I think that's a, actually a really good use of impact evaluation, mm -hmm. testing at scale in the actual health system. How does this work? And, and informing those decisions, hopefully also informing the decisions of a PMI or the Global Fund mm -hmm. for AIDS, TB, and Malaria. What will they subsidize and what won't they? Great. Mm -hmm. uh, other, the other questions? Anyone want to pick them up? Oh, are they? One, so uh, you should answer the message. Yeah, and the other was on Mexico City evaluation or impact and assessment. So, You're doing a paper on that, aren't you, Jen? Uh, well, I was going to turn to the panelists first. But <laughs> 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 uh, well, all I can say is at this point in time in PMI, we, there's no impact on what we're doing. Um, so that's where we are, uh, whether mm -hmm. what that looks like five or 10 years from now, I don't know, but at the moment there's no impact mm -hmm. on the PMI programming and our support to countries and our ability to continue to reach people with the goods with the national mm -hmm. programs. 
And I, but that's malaria. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would just say, and you may know this already, that there are um, there is an the government itself is the U.S. government is looking into this, uh, or at least a, some kind of scoping exercise to see what the potential impacts could be. But it's the challenge of assessing the impact is that it's quite early to be able to assess actual impact. And then there's um, what I would just call behavior change effects. So organizations are still making decisions about whether to comply or not, um, whether to apply for funding or not. And so how do you capture the, the, that that itself has an effect? And so I think bottom line, we won't know for a while what the actual health impacts are. Um, but there are there's a, a research group that's developing several several research projects to look at this. So that's that's what I know. Um, anyone else want to pick up on that or the complex emergencies piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we do have a project in, in UNICEF known as HEPI, Health Emergency Preparedness Initiative, whereby after Ebola. Uh, someone in their wisdom actually sat down and said, which are the diseases with epidemic potential? Do we know how to detect them, prevent them, cure them, et cetera, et cetera? And then they did a, basically a big matrix and colored it. And wherever it was red or yellow, they started looking for, for partners and what was going on and seeing whether they could work uh, mm -hmm. to, to stimulate something. So again, and just to, to uh, mm -hmm. second what you're saying, there's need for innovation. And, and I, I think also, finally, the, the ur much as it might, might apply less to a malaria, but the urbanization challenge is going to bring uh, on a, a lot of new challenges as well in, in terms of epidemiology and, and need for innovation. Yeah, we may we'll be protected because it's closer to winter, but mm -hmm. you don't have to go to Yemen or someplace that you can't visualize to understand the challenges right. of complex emergencies. I'm very worried about what's going to happen with things closer to home, like Houston, the mm. state of Florida. All of our favorite vectors are there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of water there right now, <laughs> Puerto Rico. So unless they all drowned, I'm worried about six to nine mm. months from now and something mm -hmm. that's going to be need to be prepared for and managed because they don't have roofs. They don't have a way to communicate. How do you intervene? It makes mm -hmm. that very, very, very visible. So I'm, I'm cognizant we're at time, but I just want to, a couple of you have already said, you know, what's next for evaluation. I just want to see if anyone else wants to add or, or Amanda, what's the next uh, million save going to, yeah. what, what's your vision for what it will be able to show? What should we be thinking about for well, your next few supplements? Yeah, I think some of the things that are in this supplement would be very, very good candidates for inclusion in the next edition of Million Save, hopefully in five years, hopefully I have nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 it's a collection of, of programs that are operating at scale that have rigorous uh, attributable impact on health. So take a look at that. Um, and I hope that we'll also see more on this technology issue. There's so much happening now, and it's not very well tested. And if we really do want that leapfrog idea to happen, let's, let's start to look at that more systematically. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey, Regina is gone, so I can give her all these ideas. Exactly. I want, I, well, the embedding research in programming and finding how you can do rapid action research, uh, particularly with capacity development in countries where you get implementers and researchers together uh, around the same table. And actually the research questions or the innovation needs for that matter come from the implementers and the program people. Uh, I think that would be a great yeah. thing to do. Uh, some of it doesn't lend itself to a full supplement, but maybe it we'll can take feature an as a box in, in, yeah. in there. <laughs> and secondly, analyzing the failures. Yep. Mm -hmm. Patrick? Yeah, I think mine goes along with that, and I don't want it to be too sobering, but sooner or later we're going to be convened not to celebrate a success, but to think seriously about a real challenge that we're facing, a reversal. Whether that occurs in one of those really vulnerable uh, locations that's, that we're aware of right now, or whether it occurs in a way that uh, Elizabeth Gizemo was talking about earlier, where it just occurs from uh, from uh, our attention and our, our enthusiasm waning for a minute and things mm. evolving the way we know they inevitably will. What I hope is that when that happens, we've uh, learned the lessons uh, here today and made the careful investments that it'll take that we have the resources and the information available uh, at that time to know what to do to mm. mitigate it. Bernard, I'll give you the last word if you want 
Uh, well, <laughs> it's hard to uh, have the last word in such a rich discussion, but the bottom line is, uh, I think the same point the first panel made, the U.S. government's in here for the long haul. Um, hopefully the next supplement to TropMed will be about how we eliminated malaria and not, um, mm -hmm. but in the interim there will be a lot of learning that goes on as many people have mm -hmm. pointed out and, and some new tools. I mean, here, here. you know, if we'd been sitting here in 2000, there were no rapid diagnostic mm -hmm. tests, there were no ACTs, there were no long lasting nets. So in our own career, things have changed dramatically yeah. and the set of, not only, as Gina says, we can go a long way to close the gaps with the existing tools, but some of the investments and in research going forward um, and the role of CDC and NIH and other parts of the U.S. government in helping to develop and test those is going to be kind of crucial because I do think we will have new approaches to diagnosis, new approaches to vector control, new things we can do, and the whole m &E systems and our ability to report on that will then need to recalibrate to mm -hmm. be able to capture that. Well, thank you. Um, please join me in thanking the panelists, the authors, the organizers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention and staying with us this afternoon for this timely and important discussion. I'd also like to thank Jen for excellent moderation of the second panel. And we look forward to seeing you back here at the center in future. Thanks very much. Thank you.